We're doing something a little different today. Some of you might have seen that in our email that went out. Um, We've been in this Faith Like a Child series, and I have never met a child who didn't ask why. Sometimes it sounds like a chorus. Why? 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 Um, So we thought this would be a good way to end. Uh, We've done a questions service one other time. That time you got to ask the questions. So this time our children's Sunday school class got to ask the questions. Some of them are softballs and some of them are not. (laughs) So my able assistant is going to ask the questions. Hello and welcome back to the Rush Creek Sunday podcast. (laughs) Thank you for being with us as you are each and every week. Uh, Just a quick word from our sponsors, returning sponsor HelloFresh, we're glad to have you, and also our new sponsor... Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We're glad to have you as well. Joining us this day is our esteemed colleague and friend, Reverend Tiff. Uh, And Tiff, we sent out an email to some of our uh, listeners out there on the interwebs, uh, and they gave uh, that email to their children. Uh, Not a lot of screen time rules out there. Um, And those children gave us some great questions, as you uh, said at the top of the episode. Um, uh, Some of these are not easy questions. No. Uh, Very excited about how you handle these. Remember, we are sponsored today, so whatever keeps our sponsorship money coming in would be great. (laughs) And so we're just going to dive right into it. We've got these kind of bracketed in themes of questions, and so we're going to start out with uh, some questions about creation, and then we've got a couple questions about the Hebrew Bible, and then uh, some questions that pertain more to the New Testament, and then we've got some questions just for you personally as well. Uh, So Tiff, the listeners want to know, (laughs) how was God created? And if God made everything, then who or what made God? How was God created? Well, God was the only thing that was never created. God is the only entity, the only being that always was always will be, always has been. God is beyond space and time. Those are human constructions. Uh, And so God was not made. God is the only thing, the creator is the only thing that was never created. Okay. All right, we'll send that out. (laughs) We'll see if the audience is satisfied with that one. Um, You at home, let us know with your comments, questions, or concerns on our answers. (laughs) Uh, Follow-up question to that one. What, uh, if God created everything, what was the first thing that God created? Well, Genesis 1, you know, there are two creation stories. You all know that. Uh, The first one says that God created light first and that God separated light from the darkness. And that was the first work that God did. The second creation story says that God created the heavens and the earth first. So either it's light or it's the heavens, which kind of go together. And if if you've read much science, then you know that the first things we think God created were protons and neutrons and electrons, and that somehow that dust gathered into mass and created stars. So actually, science agrees with our scriptures on this one. Science and um, religion don't have to be enemies. Um, Science is a gift from God to help us understand God. So light or the heavens, that's... That's what God worked on first. Interesting outlook. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. (laughs) Uh, Following with that, uh, I guess, theme of light, uh, recently, I'm not sure it quite made it down to our skies, but we've got a question here from a listener that, uh, wondering, did God invent the northern lights? The northern lights. You know, we finally leave the Midwest, and then the northern lights were visible for days where we used to live. (laughs) Never seen them. Um, I guess my answer to that would be that God created beauty and that God created the natural world. Uh, And so the things that cause awe in us that we find beautiful are things that God caused to happen, even though I don't think God decided on this day I'm going to make them see the northern lights. But God created the natural world that grows and exists around us Um, I think just because God likes beauty and God likes art. The northern lights are definitely art at its best. 
There's some Picasso paintings, I think, that might be a little put to shame by them. Never seen them. <laughs> w- would love to get up to where they are, or if they decide to come back to town, would love a, a clear night to see them. Uh, sticking with our creation questions, um, we've got one from a very curious listener uh, that's very interested about the, the protons and neutrons in space. And so we were wondering, did God make space? Follow-up question. Did God make the Milky Way? Follow-up, follow-up question. Did God make the moon? And follow-up, follow-up, follow-up question. Did God make all of the other planets and their moons, too? Yes. <laughs> Thank you Good so enough. much for your thoughtful engagement. <laughs> Follow-up question to, to follow those follow-up up, yeah. questions. Did God make other universes? I don't know, but I sure hope so. I don't think we'll ever know. But I sure hope so. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, now we're, we're going to kind of transfer, um, after a word from our sponsors, into the questions about uh, the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Mm. And I'm getting word that our sponsors have, have pulled out their ad reads. So we're just going to launch <laughs> right into the rest okay. of the, um, the comment or the questions here. Uh, so our first question pertaining to the Old Testament Hebrew Bible is, uh, is it true that God asked Noah to get every male animal and every baby animal on the ark? So that's not quite the story that we're told. Um, the story goes that God asked Noah to make space for two of every animal, male and female, and seven pairs of the clean animals and seven pairs of the birds. That part gets lost in the vacation Bible school version of the story, but it's two of every animal, male and female, and seven pairs of clean animals and seven pairs of birds. Go look it up. It's there. Some of you are doubting me, but it's there. (laughs) Our next question from the, the listeners um, it seems like a pretty tough one, so I'm going to throw a softball uh, from myself about Noah's Ark. What do you think the Ark smelled like? <laughs> well, I'm from farm country, so I know what the Ark smelled like. All right. I won't dig in <laughs> further than that, because I don't know if I want to know, actually. Uh, so your next question uh, it is a pretty heavy one. Yeah. Um, our, our kids are very thoughtful and they engage with these scriptures very deeply and they would like to know um, why did Isaac like one of his sons more than the other? Yeah, that's a tough one. It does seem like in Genesis that Isaac prefers Esau and that Rebekah prefers Jacob and that they each sort of work for one or the other's success. And if and I, I went back and reread it and it sure does seem like they have favorites. Um, the only thing I can figure from that is that Esau was more like Isaac and Jacob was more like Rebekah. It says that Jacob liked to be in the kitchen. He liked to cook. Um, he liked to host. And Esau was sort of a, he was a hunter. He was a tough guy. And it seems like Isaac, maybe, I'm putting a lot into the text, but it seems like that's the kind of man that, that Isaac tended to value more, even though they're both his sons. Um, The other thing is the oldest son was supposed to get the blessing of the father. And it was pretty important to follow those types of rules. And so Esau would have want Isaac would have wanted Esau to get the blessing because that's the way it was supposed to be done. And we have a lot of rule followers in the Hebrew Bible. The other thing I would say to the kids is that God doesn't have favorites. God has no favorite children. And what my favorite quote about that is that God loves each of us as if there was only one of us. So God doesn't have favorites. God loves each of God's children like there was only one. Thank you. I think that, that <laughs> helps me. That's always a question that those family dynamics we see throughout Scripture can sometimes get a, a little tricky. Um, I think about what you said um, in a recent sermon about, you know, the world is perfect on page one of the Bible, and the rest of Scripture is trying to get back to page one. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been sitting with that for a few days now, um, and I think we see that in some of these dynamics. Uh, Your your next question is another kind of family dynamic uh, question, and it is, 
is it true that Jacob gave Joseph the rainbow coat? Another story about favorites, right? Um, Joseph had many, or Jacob had many sons, and Joseph gets the fancy coat. I looked it up in a bunch of different translations. Mine, this one says, he was given a long robe with sleeves. Another says, ornate robe, a long coat of many colors, a tunic of many colors, or an elaborately embroidered coat. So I think the answer is, he was given something fancy and expensive that his brothers didn't have. And that's what started the jealousy. Or it, it, sort of, it was the last straw of this dynamic of him being clearly the favorite of his father. The other thing I wanted to say about that is in pictures, in, in, in um, Jewish or Christian art, it's often a rainbow-colored coat that Joseph has on. And I just want you to remember, every time you look at a piece of art about people of the faith, the artists have made choices. And so it's always important to go back to Scripture and see uh, where they have embellished or where they have left out some of those things. Because every piece of art, there were no photographs back then, right? There have been choices made. For instance, when we picture Adam and Eve, I bet you picture Eve eating an apple. That's because in Western art, Eve is always depicted with an apple. But I'm guessing in the Middle East, it wasn't an apple. The other one is Jonah, and we always talk about Jonah and the whale. The Bible doesn't say Jonah was swallowed by a whale. It says Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. So always check your art to make sure. Some of you I know are watching The Chosen. Have you checked to make sure they got the details right, or are they making artistic choices? I haven't watched it, so I don't know. <laughs> Listeners, call in or send us emails about what mistakes The Chosen has made in their production. <laughs> Or any Don't mistakes you've seen in any shows that you're watching, I would love to, to read those. All right, and then we've got a couple questions. This is our uh, last question um, pertaining to the Hebrew Bible, um, but it, it kind of sets a theme um, for a few more, and it's kind of asking you to put yourself in the shoes of the characters in these uh, stories in Scripture. And so one of our listeners wants to know, if you were Jewish during the plagues of Egypt... Would you follow Moses, or would you do what Pharaoh said? Ooh, that's a tough one. I'm sure I would have doubted Moses at first. Um, I would have thought he was a mole, because people would have known he was raised by Egyptians, and then suddenly he switches alliances. He's raised in the palace as part of Pharaoh's family. This feels like a spy or a mole, right? So I think I would have doubted at first. Is this guy legit? Or is he doing the work of Pharaoh? And I think um, Moses grows as a leader throughout Scripture, throughout Exodus. He grows more confident. Um, he grows in his skills. And I think it would have taken me personally time to see that growth before I bought into to following him. That's a, that's a tough one. And I, I think uh, <laughs> thank you for your honesty there. Um, be sure to join us next week when all of our questions are, does Jesus love us? <laughs> and speaking of Jesus, we're going to launch into the New Testament portion of our questions now. Um, and your first question is, why was Jesus the one to be the Prince of Peace? Why was Jesus called the Prince of Peace? A um, couple of reasons. Isaiah calls him that, calls the Messiah the Prince of Peace. Remember what we read at Christmas? The Messiah is coming to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So Isaiah's prediction about the Messiah was that he would be a Prince of Peace. The second one is Jesus' message was peace. Really at its core, he tells people to put down their swords, um, to put them away, and he preaches peace. So I think the prediction matches the man and the message that he brought. And it's why a lot of people who've been around this church for a long time, at, at the end of church, when we are done singing, they'll look at you and say, peace. That's part of practicing, uh, walking in the way of the Prince of Peace. Our questions are not going to get easier from here. <laughs> no. Uh, this is another one, though, that asks uh, for you to kind of place yourself in the shoes of um, the folks we see in Scripture. And so this question is, if you were Mary or one of Jesus' disciples, 
What would you have done when he was crucified? This is my daughter's question. (laughs) I would like to think if I were Mary, I would have stayed with Jesus. I would have pretended to be strong. I would think I would have talked to him to take his mind off the pain. I think I would have been angry and devastated. I think I would have had a lot of doubts and questions throwing God's way in my head, but not out loud because I would have wanted to be strong. I think I would have been thinking about that visit from the angel and the wise men and is this what they meant for my son's life? But mostly I would have pretended to be strong. <laughs> Disciples? Did you already ask that one? No, you're getting okay, ahead of sorry. me. We, we didn't plant any questions. We did not, Tiff has not seen these questions beforehand. <laughs> so your next question does have to pertain to the disciples, though. Uh, quite the gift of clairvoyance you've got. Uh, and one of our listeners uh, wants to know, did the disciples invent churches? Did the disciples invent churches? Um, that's a hard one. I think the disciples had to figure out what to do after Jesus left, and they spent a lot of time at the temple, but eventually they figured out that uh, time at the temple wasn't enough, and so they started to gather on Sundays. Um, So I think that when they listened to God and listened for God's Spirit, that um, that led them to the church. But Spirit comes before church. Church is a product of the work of the Spirit, not the other way around. And I think we're out of time. We can make more time. And let me write that down real quick, because that was good. <laughs> Spirit comes before church. Maybe one more. We can do one more. All right, so uh, I can let you look at our questions here, unless you've somehow managed <laughs> to get them in front of yourself. Uh, and I'll, I'll let you answer which question y- you would like. We've got, um, if you could change one thing you did in the past, what would it be? Or... If you could go back in time, what would be the first sermon you preached as a new pastor? If I could change one thing in the past, other than every time I've ever been mean or lost my temper, um, I think that, so I got accepted to to college down here, TCU, um, and then I chickened out and didn't come. I went to a state college closer to home for a year and a half. That was a really great experience, but I think if I had one thing to do over, I would have kicked myself and said, just be brave and just go, because you know that's where you're supposed to be. Wonderful. But it turned out all right in the end. (laughs) So I got accepted to my class twice. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much for answering these questions. Thank you at home for sending in (laughs) your questions. Um, And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Rush Creek Christian Church on Sunday morning, or whatever we call this. So, (laughs) thank you so much.